Hello and welcome to the Cooperative City in Quarantine, episode number 14. Now, yet again from our homes, sharing with, with one another experiences of what is happening in cities around, around Europe dur during and after, hopefully after also, the, the COVID crisis. Today, as you know, as you might have seen also from our communication, is our final quarantine episode. Now, this is also wishful thinking that we will not have to go back in quarantine after the summer break. And this, let's all work towards this together. But this is also because we believe that after these very, very strange months that we have lived, we have shared a lot of insights of what is happening in this moment. And now that finally we can go out of our homes a little bit, depending on which countries we're in, it is time also to start seeing how can we actually start planning what is happening in our cities on more long term. Throughout the number of episodes, we have seen that there are so many social and solidarity economy practices around Europe, more volunteering, more enterprise, more entrepreneurial initiatives that have been really been fundamental partners in all our cities and in all our territories to really manage the emergency. But we see now also that somehow the attention towards all this solidarity is going down as the, as we see for example in just in these days there is a lot of discussion about what will be the eu funding going and you know there are different positions depending on all the countries on how the how much and in which way the funding should be allocated and in some little way this is what we're also doing this evening but what we'll be trying to do is not thinking about starting up yet something new but trying to bring together the, the all the initiatives and the people that are already working in bringing together innovation and change and social inclusion in cities and in territories throughout Europe and try to think together how can we also make sure that this is also an opportunity to really not leave anybody behind in the face of this upcoming social and economic crisis that it's, is ahead of us. So today we have a fantastic panel. It's a bit different to the panels we previously had. Many of you know that usually we try to have a mix from social innovation and civic organizations, research, city councils, um, private enterprises, and today is a bit different. We actually have all organizations that are uh, directly or indirectly working uh, as in the EU. Um, and the reason for this is that we believe that after this work that we have done all together up until now, this is the opportunity to really bring together and bring forward the, uh, the, the 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 discussion to a level that is also shared with with uh, with with a bit with let's say bigger players that are really trying to make a change together. So we would like to share with you our speakers of today. So from myself, first of all, uh, as you know, I'm Daniela Patti from Utropian, and uh, been we've been running the Cooperative City magazine for uh, about five years now. And in the quarantine, we have decided to set up the, the set of episodes together with my colleagues, Levante Poliak and Bahan Wanazia. So who are muted, so they cannot say hello to you. <laughs> well, anyway. You will get to hear them throughout the episode. And what we would also be very, very happy to um, to have you uh, to have you with us is uh, we have with us Nula Morgan from uh, Urbact, uh, Johannes Riegler from JPI Urban Europe, Nicolas Stuhlinger from the Innovation in Politics Institute, Martin Griesel from the EUKN, and then we have our colleagues directly representing the, the from the from the DGs uh, of the European Commission. So we're very happy to have Marianne Doyen from the DG Employment. Hi, well, very welcome. And uh, Peter Takac and Andor Urmos from the European panel, considering Statistically, the the number of the population is it's quite it's quite relevant that we have uh, three Hungarians out of out of uh, uh, the, the speakers. We will be having uh, also uh, a number of speakers who will be joining throughout the throughout the session. So we uh, we we count on everybody's uh, flexibility also to uh, to uh, welcome our new speakers who will be joining joining us. And at this point, I would be very happy to pass on the word to my colleague Levente who will be framing a little bit what's what has been happening up to up to now from our side. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Daniela. I'm also very happy to have you all here. Can I have the slides uh, from your side, please? Um, what I would like to do is very, very briefly. 
Okay. And please turn off your microphones uh, so we don't hear the background noise. So I would like to just give you a very, very brief uh, background of who, who we are and why we uh, do this. Um, I can also share my screen if that's actually uh, better. I guess you see my slides. Okay. So, because the cooperative sitting quarantine is not without any precedent. So, as Daniel mentioned, five years ago, we founded the Cooperative City magazine because we realized that traveling and, and working with a variety of municipalities, we realized that in Europe, there's an emergent uh, scene, there's a growing number of uh, citizen initiatives, bottom-up initiatives, or organizations working closely with municipalities who have a very strong impact on the quality of life uh, in our cities and also the way uh, they uh, develop services. And we also realized that many of these initiatives have very little visibility, uh, even locally, but especially internationally, which made them impossible to better uh, position themselves and also understand how to uh, get in touch with each other, how to share uh, knowledge and exchange their practices. So we thought it was very important to work a little bit uh, on this, bring them together. And uh, also we identified some topics that have been very crucial in urban transformation in Europe, just a few of them, urban regeneration, social inclusion, policy and governance, economy and finance. We all try to look into these topics and many others through the ways how municipalities and uh, bottom-up initiatives can collaborate. We went to a lot of cities and we talked with a lot of people. We made interviews. We covered a big part of Europe also because we realized again that uh, many of these initiatives op operated only on a very local level uh, in the national languages and there was very little resource internationally. Um, of course, when the quarantine arrived, we had a very similar feeling somehow because we realized that in the first weeks of the lockdown, most of the discussion was taking place in national languages. Uh, and this was quite uh, an issue because we realized that this, in the very beginning, we didn't feel the exchange. We felt that Europe was disappearing from the whole uh, discussion and nation states were back with closed borders. And we, we were really missing this kind of exchange that we actually got used to. So this is why we launched uh, Cooperative City in uh, quarantine, where we, uh, tried to bridge this gap and brought together uh, a lot of people, our colleagues, our partners, and also people we didn't know, but we thought were very important to contribute to this discussion. We, uh, we were working on topics like food, culture, tourism, uh, mobility, labor, urban commons, education, refugees, public spaces, community venues, some of the key issues that we thought were uh, quite imp important. We had a bit of visibility, we had over 65,000 people reached. Of course, there were some peaks when also the lockdown had its peak. And in the end, of course, everybody's slowly happy to uh, get out of the street, especially on Friday afternoons. But still, we think that uh, the discussion we had resonated with a uh, with a lot of people. And there were many, many uh, themes that came up. Many, uh, this is a little bit of a, a tech cloud of some of the topics we, we talked about. And inside all these topics, there were maybe two main converging ideas uh, that came out of the discussions. One was uh, something that many people mentioned is, is social economy and social entrepreneurship. That is also one of the topics of today because we realized that many organizations uh, that are active uh, in territories, uh, companies, uh, cooperatives, different kinds of social uh, 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 organizations with an economical scope, which had a stronger anchorage locally and which had a stronger engagement and value driven mission locally. They were uh, on the one hand more resilient uh, to a certain extent and also they were catering much better to the communities. We saw a lot of uh, profit driven uh, initiatives, especially tourism, evaporating in a, in, a, in a matter of a few days, a few weeks, while a lot of socially more anchored uh, projects were actually uh, survived and maintained and kept their presence to help also their local uh, initiatives. The other main topic uh, was inclusion, because we realized that the lockdown actually uh, amplified divisions, amplified uh, inequality, and we realized that uh, inclusion has to be a very key focus in the coming area. This is a little bit to summarize how we got here and why we came up with this manifesto that uh, Daniela will be uh, presenting to you in a second. 
better than my words will be a video. We advocate for existing knowledge, policy recommendations, and financial resources to be geared towards the strengthening of social and solidarity economy practices throughout Europe. We believe that this is the way forward to not leave anyone behind. During the COVID-19 crisis throughout Europe, we have seen solidarity practices, essential welfare services being developed by civic organizations often in cooperation with the local authorities and businesses. Furthermore, we have seen that social purpose companies were more resilient in this crisis than simple for-profit companies. Aside from the dramatic health crisis, we know that we have only seen the tip of the iceberg in terms of socio-economic impacts that the coronavirus will have on our society. We face an increase in poverty, a rise in unemployment, at the same time, there is a great potential in social and solidarity economy in Europe. While social businesses have different legal forms and operate in a wide range of sectors, they all pursue a social mission within their business activity. In the face of the upcoming economic and social crisis, we advocate for Europe to support the social and solidarity economy as an opportunity to ensure economic sustainability to all those people who are already in a condition or at high risk of poverty. We need to ensure policy support to solidarity practices as a means to strengthen our democracy. We need capacity building for enterprises and public authorities to be competitive. We need solidarity funds, grants or revolving funds to support social and solidarity economic initiatives. But funding is not only expressed in terms of financial liquidity, it also means access to space to pursue socially relevant services and investing in human capital through better labor conditions. These are not new ideas for the EU, which has greatly invested towards better knowledge, better policy and better funding. Mm -hmm. But it's time to put in place those ideas rapidly and back them up with the necessary financial resources. This manifesto is currently being subscribed by many organizations in Europe. It's a starting point for dialogue and action to take place. Join us. Welcome to our first panel. Uh, we have the pleasure to talk about talk with in Johannes Riedler from JPI Urban Europe, Nicolas Stühlinger from the Innovation in Politics. Uh, we will have Marjolein from European Cultural Foundation, but also Martin Griselt uh, from European Urban Knowledge Network in this panel. Um, since ECF couldn't participate in this um, um, talk live, we will show you a video message from her, which will give us a little bit input how ECF is um, coping up with the current situation. Stefano? Okay, we need one more minute for the video. So um, you, uh, we saw the manifesto um, and we will be asking our uh, panelists how they, um, how they worked in the last three months, uh, how um, they support their, uh, their organizations on ground, how the collaboration with the different national uh, uh, states are and what they learned out of this crisis and how they are going to proceed uh, in the second phase of this year and um, what the kind of lessons we learned in the last three months and which can help us with our further goals like climate adaptation, social inclusion and so on. Now we are going live with the video. Enjoy.
We advocate for existing knowledge, policy recommendations, and financial resources. This is the excitement of going live. Apologies, there was a little bit of challenges from the back office. Apologies, <laughs> we're back online in a minute. Okay, let's start with Nicolas uh, from the Innovation in Politics Institute. You have been uh, collecting best practices in the last three months and you also started a survey. Uh, would you like to explain us what the best practices are about and what kind of challenges are, um, are coming in the second half of this uh, beautiful year? Yeah, th so thank you very much for inviting me um, actually to this uh, amazing panel. So before I, I start, maybe I should give you some context about what we do. So the Innovation and Politics Institute is an international active organization that identifies, develops and applies innovation in politics with the aim of strengthening democracy in Europe. So what we saw in the first days of the crisis is that um, the situation itself created a lot of confusion in a broad spectrum of policy areas. So we felt the need with, that we need to contribute. And um, we launched a project called Coping with the Crisis, where we collect, document, and provide innovative best practices in dealing with the crisis across Europe and at all polit political levels. Um, so what we do so to support cities during the crisis is to provide them with best practices in many areas, from innovative ways, ways to organize and support homeschooling efforts to caring for the elderly and the most vulnerable um, in, so in many, many um, policy areas. I just want to highlight three projects which I find really, really interesting is um, there's a project in Klagenfurt, which is uh, a bigger city in Austria, which launched a campaign at, or launched an initiative for phone tutorials. So retired teachers help pupils with the main subjects such as maths and languages. In Sweden, we saw um, a project where, um, where a, a company reskilled flight attendants. So as you know, there was no um, flights going through Europe. Um, so there was basically the need to reskill those people who are, who are flight attendants and, and um, um, put them in their health, in, uh, health sector to support basic needs. Um, we saw the city of Vienna, which created explanatory videos. And so, so we have so many positive best practices we, we wanted to share and we shared on our platform. So far we have shared about 400 of them. So as you, as you said, um, we, what we did was we, well, what we're doing actually just now and, and, and luckily many of, our, many of, of the organizations particip participating in this panel also helping us with, we, we set up a, a survey to anticipate what are the challenges of governments of cities in the next two months and maybe also in the early 21. And uh, the, the, the service is running actually currently. So I want to show you with one insight was which struck me actually. So what, what, we are, what, what the responses actually say is there are major, basically three policy areas cities are currently struggling with or municipalities. So the first question is, how can they fix the problems they're currently facing in terms of budget and finances? So as you probably could guess, business taxes are going down, which is an important income for many, for many municipalities. So there are, there are many restraints created in terms of budget and finance. The second is also um, probably predictable was um, the question, how can new jobs be created? And the third one is, of course, uh, the healthcare and care systems. But what I found interesting when looking at the data first is um, when we ask politicians um, in cities where they need support in terms of where they, where, where they, where they want to get um, information about best practices um, in the second half of 2020, 2020 is, does not say they need uh, best practice in terms of um, finance or creating new jobs. What they're looking for is best practices in, in three areas. It's mobility, 
um, digitalization, digitalization of services and democracy and civic participation. And it, that, what, that's what I found a little, I didn't expect that um, to come out. Um, and I think that's, that, that's a good point to start the discussion uh, with you guys because I see social entrepreneurship and social economy uh, playing a crucial role in solving these problems. Thank you very much, Nicolas. I think mobility, digitalization also partially feel, uh, fits well with what GPI Urban Europe is doing. Johannes, would you like to share with us what uh, have you been doing? What is the response from national agencies from different countries? How do you support all the projects and countries and what kind of um, aftermath will that have for GPI Urban Europe, this situation? Absolutely, thank you so much. Also from my side, welcome and thank you for, for this invitation to this great panel and this opportunity to speak here today. Just to give you a brief um, framework where we are operating in. So I work for the Joint Programming Initiative Urban Europe, which is a research and innovation funding program aiming at supporting capacity building uh, for public administration and all kind of other actors to develop pathways to sustainable and livable urban futures. So I when we talk about this, this, the question has been, what has your organization done and planning to do to support the post-COVID-19 phase? So I would actually like to widen this perspective a little bit for this discussion. So COVID-19 is, of course, a very, very pressing challenge, has a very tremendous uh, impact on our cities, but it is one crisis which we are facing in an increasingly turbulent time in the Anthropocene. So one of the key areas of JPI or Europe, or one of the priority areas is actually urban robustness. So we have four key areas we are focusing on. Urban robustness is one, which deals with a lot of issues which we see coming up or saw coming up over the last, last weeks. To give you a bit, bit of a flavor of what that means, so urban robustness, what we understand by it, that it, it anticipates a challenge um, in how urban societies handle increased and deeper turbulences in crisis. In this line of thinking, resilience is a good thing, so to say, but we decided to focus on robustness because resilience might be a little bit of a big, bit too weak concept to discuss because resilience is also a kind of idea of saving what we have and it might go against it, uh, transformations and positive and good disruptions. So how we understand robustness in this concept is actually a, as a driver to make cities livable and sustainable as far as possible in the first place and then go back and see how can we maintain the sustainability there. So we also see that the COVID-19 crisis is, is a very reflexive moment uh, in time. So we see that all of a sudden there's opportunities popping up to have a hard look at our urban and societal practices as such. And this momentum might ease the political task to sorting out what practices in an urban environment seem reasonable to keep, but also those which we might want to get rid of in the long run. So this is what we are, our thoughts behind, the, behind this one. Just to give you just one more thing, how we gonna deal with that in let's say the next half year, we are currently preparing a joint call in cooperation with the European Commission named uh, Urban Transformation Capacities. So what we mean behind that is uh, to, to support urban actors to make experimental and co-creative ap approaches in terms of urban design, Baukultur and so on, uh, the new normal. So that would also mean what can we learn from these experiments, the social practices which we've seen over the last months coming in from out of necessity from the COVID crisis, what can we learn from that? How can we synthesize this knowledge which has been created and how to take the next step from there? Thank you very much, Johannes. Um, the good thing about GPI Urban Europe is that uh, there are so many different types of organizations which can uh, connect and try to solve problems in urban areas. Um, but there is also a European Cultural Foundation, which is specifically made for, um, for uh, creatives and cultural organizations. And therefore we will now see the video finally uh, of Marjolein, uh, her message. Thank you.
Hello, everyone. My name is Marjolein Kramer, and I work as a senior advocacy officer at the European Cultural Foundation based in Amsterdam. As a response to the corona crisis, the European Cultural Foundation has created the Culture of Solidarity Fund. It was established to unite Europe by funding local players to build alliances with the European idea in mind. To revive the European sense of solidarity and belonging, share experiences, imagine a better future and together rebuild a common public space. The Culture of Solidarity Fund offers various application windows this year. Our first deadline already closed on April the 27th, and the next round is opening up this Monday. The first round was met with an overwhelming response of more than 2,500 proposals received from all across Europe. It showed a tremendous need for co-funding in regions with less or no public emergency funding for cultural or European initiatives available, like South and Central Eastern Europe, but also the UK. The funding opportunities over it range from smaller grants up to 50,000 euros to some bigger grants of 50,000 euros. What we have seen is that the individuals or organizations who applied work in and with culture, but also collaborate with other sectors to achieve creative solutions. They often try to connect and grow local initiatives of, crisis, of creative crisis response into larger and stronger alliances of pan-European solidarity. I can give you one example of the projects, the European Declaration of Urban Rights by SuroArc, an architecture platform based in Madrid, but also in other cities like Berlin, Bologna and La Coruña. The project describes that in the Europe of today, cities need to confront new and enormous global challenges, but that there is the opportunity to redefine notions of urban culture and mobilize for a new ecological and democratic sensitivity in this post-pandemic world. What they want with the project is to construct a virtual public meeting place, a sort of Europarliament of urban rights, to debate modes of organization and the construction of common spaces. Inspired by this idea of the parliament, this project is a commitment to connect to a net to connect a network of citizens, civil society organizations, professionals and amateurs of urbanism to recover lessons and experiences born out of the current and previous crises. In order to together imagine proposals for future challenges in various scales and contexts through, uh, throughout Europe. And this is exactly what we were looking for to connect the local with the European in a flexible and hands-on way, and to grow a collective impact for a European culture of solidarity. So to us, solidarity, and together with that, a Europe that is based on a social economy, where open and shared public spaces, outward-looking experiences are possible. To us, the corona crisis is not only a challenge to public health, our economy, and social cohesion, it's a challenge to our way of life. The way we Europeans deal with the situation will have profound implications on how we build Europe of today and tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you, Marilyn. I don't know if you are uh, uh, online right now, but very important uh, what you did in such a short time. Um, in a couple of weeks, 2,400 organizations just came up with an idea like this to to strengthen Europe, to prepare Europe, and to deal with this situation. Um, I would like to turn to Martin Griesel from European Urban Knowledge Network. How does, the, does your organization respond to the situation and the very big will of people in Europe to change things for the positive or use this moment as a transformation? What, what is your impression? What did you do in the last three months? And what are you going to do in the next, next six, uh, six months? You're muted. Yeah. Perfect. Um, Thank okay. you. Not muted anymore. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm used to host a lot of video meetings myself. And then I'm never muted indeed. Um, no, thank you for the invitation indeed. Yeah, what changed in the last three months? Well, I've been working, this is my new office, which is in home at home in Amsterdam, and that's a big difference. I'm 
people who know me always think that I'm always traveling abroad. And uh, apart from some very, very short trips in the Netherlands, I mean, I haven't left my home in Amsterdam since the past three months. And that's a big difference, of course. Um, and thinking about that, I mean, the way we communicate now with our members, which are member states uh, working on, uh, on urban issues at the, at the national level, we are a network of member states with, uh, with ministries responsible for urban development, and we work at European level with different stakeholders on, on policy and research, uh, showing the interface between policy and research, actually, that's what we do. I mean, we changed our working methods a lot. Uh, and what is really interesting to see, and this, is, has, this will have a, a big impact, of course, on society as a whole, is that actually you can be very effective even with video conferences, although people are getting a bit bored by it now. Uh, but we have been, we had a big project, uh, uh, which is still ongoing and almost coming to an end now, which is uh, to, pro to provide support to the German incoming presidency, uh, which was the, the, the idea was and still is to produce a policy framework for the next decade. Uh, and the big question that we had, of course, when we were starting to work on, um, uh, when, when the COVID crisis uh, actually uh, started, uh, was what to do with this political document that we already prepared and how to update that one. Well, actually the thing was that we, we came to the conclusion that the document that we prepared was actually quite uh, fit for purpose. Also, looking at the at the COVID crisis, we had a strong emphasis in this in this document on the green city, on the just city, and the productive city. And these are exactly the aspects that we also now see in society. Um, there's this saying, never waste a good crisis. And I think this is now something that we should really um, uh, take into consideration. There's, of course, a tendency to go back to the old normal. But the big question is, OK, what will, should we really go back to the old normal? Or should we sort of uh, prepare for something which we started preparing, which should be a new normal in a way? And, uh, and this is something I think we need to, to, to develop. I very much sympathize with the idea that Johannes presented with the JPI Urban Europe about uh, robustness, because this is exactly what we plan to do as well, uh, working closely to policymakers. How to make cities much more robust so that they can indeed uh, be prepared for, let's say, the, the, the destructive impact of, of this pandemic that we just had and that might come back, who knows, but even mean other sort of crises that are also around the corner, and the climate crisis, another financial crisis, who knows, and how to make sure that we, we are not that, that much vulnerable as we have, apparently have been, because we see the, 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 the disruptive effect of this crisis, it, it increases the social inequalities. Uh, it, uh, it also shows that some of the, so it also shows some, some very positive effects on ecology, ecology for instance. Uh, we see the air is green and the air is blue and indeed uh, people uh, get more public space as well. Uh, so these are aspects that we need to, to benefit from and to develop new policies to, to work on that. So that's what, we go, that, that's what we are doing at the moment. So we're rising policy, we work with the member states, we are preparing also our own series of webinars uh, in the near future, uh, starting with the Urban Thinkers Campus, uh, with the UN Habitats. We will be working also with uh, uh, colleagues from JPI Urban Europe in this field, so working on, on soft modes or active modes of mobility, for instance. Uh, give more room to walking and to cycling. And we are working with our own members, member states on this, uh, on this topic. So actually uh, uh, with countries like Spain and uh, Czech Republic and Poland and France and, and, uh, and other countries as well, to see how we can uh, create, let's say, uh, long-term uh, change policies for member at the member state level, because we see that Immediately after the crisis, there was a sort of an emergency response. So how to how to how to organize this or that? How to uh, accommodate the most vulnerable people who got uh, who got out of jobs, for instance, who became uh, well, who were also faced by by poverty, for instance. But the real question, I think, is really how to transform society in such a way that we can actually um, uh, learn from this crisis, how to be better prepared for the longer run. And I think this is, this is the big challenge that we should also uh, uh, keep, uh, how to make sure that it will be embedded in long-term policies. And this is uh, what we will be start 
but that we will start working on now also with the incoming presidencies, Germany, Portugal, Slovenia, and also the other countries that we are all working with and that we will provide support to as well. I would like to have a final round with feedback and reactions to each other. Um, as uh, Martin said, uh, we had a lot of positive uh, feelings about the not the lockdown per se, but slowing down, having more time with the family, with your neighborhood, because you don't have to go travel every day, an hour or half hour to work and that you experience the city, the community different, that you um, highlight what is really important in life or in, in the daily life. So um, the question is, can we take these um, experiences, knowledge um, into the next round that we change working hours, change our cities and so on. So this is one, one of the uh, reasons why we uh, created this manifesto. And I would like to ask my panelists, unfortunately, Marjolein is not here, but, uh, but Johannes, Nicholas and Martin, are there reactions to each other's uh, projects uh, bes besides what Mart Martin said? And how do you see the future? And do you have any recommendations or suggestions for our manifesto? Maybe Nicholas can start? So uh, what, I, what, I, what I found, what, what I found myself thinking about just now when, when Martin uh talked it, it's it's just an amazing what what organizations are currently doing and i think um i also want to highlight um johannes um definition of robustness or what he's working on robustness is is astonishing i, I from from my point of view when i read the manifesto i can personally agree with so many many points uh which are in the manifesto and i as i said in 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 beforehand in my in my first um, a talk i see that what what we find in the in the in the survey we are conducting to currently actually is that the points which municipalities or cities want to work on they are um they are most of them are actually um things um that are, that are not directly to related to COVID. So I think uh, Johannes started his talk with, um, there are, there's, there's the COVID crisis now, but there are many other crises around COVID. There is a social crisis, there's an economic crisis, there is a, a climate crisis actually we have to, we have to, we're, we're facing. And I think the survey, what we're doing responds to what, what, what the two are saying. And I think we should help cities with not coming up with policies again and, and, and developing again and again a new policies but looking at all across Europe and 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 and, and uh, identifying what works already and what, what works best and then applying it to a new context and it's that's what I'm hoping for in in, in the 2020 and 2021. Thank you very much Nicolas. Johannes would you like to react? Yes. You have been mentioned so many times. Yeah. <laughs> I'm very happy for that. Thanks for that. Um, yeah, um, how we are dealing with, with this post-COVID situation, I would not call it a post-COVID situation, but also, again, a bit of a broader perspective of how can we include other actors of, so, of the social economy and other urban change makers, people working in community niche innovation in our program. So since the, many of you know, since the beginning, since the early phases of JPI Urban Europe, we try to provide frameworks that allow non-research and innovation actors to be part of our projects. So local public administration, actors involved in community niche innovation, who work on filling gaps in current policy making and developing new ideas and governance models and so on. So this is, this is also for us not a nice add-on to have, but it's actually an absolute necessity to, for a program on sustainable urban futures or urban transitions to have that. So it's also not new. We discussed that since 10 years. Uh, there's a lot of uh, in, uh, talk about engagement of civil organizations in programs, local initiatives. But the question is how? And this is, I think, where we have to act. So we, can, we cannot expect that these actors will just have the means, the capacity to participate in other programs which are not necessarily made for 
STEM. In our case, it's a research and innovation program. So the question is, how can we open up, how can we build frameworks who um, pay tribute to these different logics these actors are, are involved in? And I think this is where the manifesto comes in very, very handy at a very timely, uh, timely point for us, because we are currently developing a European partnership together with the European Commission. Uh, so that is a seven year research and innovation program, um, which we are currently designing. So we is the member states of JPIOM Europe and, and the commission. Uh, the, it is called uh, Driving Urban Transitions. And for this program, we are foreseeing a framework which even more than in the JPIOM Europe now involves, mobilizes civic actors and synthesizes this knowledge which uh, they create in the world, build capacities to translate that into other contexts and upscale and re, uh, the results and the experiences from that. So uh, unfortunately, I cannot talk more about the details yet because it involves a lot of decision-making, but I hope we can, we can continue this exchange among this group of people and the wider group of people once this is decided, hopefully in, in, in autumn, it would be very good to, to talk about that then. Sounds very promising, Johannes. We are really looking forward to the next talk. Martin, would you like to share your thoughts with us? Yeah, I think the, the manifesto really comes at a very good point in time. So I, I'm, I'm really, uh, I mean, I read it with great interest and I think we should also incorporate this kind of thinking in our policy making, uh, working with, uh, with member states. Um, because after all, this will be a big topic, of course, uh, that, that needs to be discussed also in the intergovernmental uh, cooperation and the work also with the European Commission, where we are involved in as well. Uh, I think what we see now is just what the, the big challenge is to, 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 to draw lessons from this, from this situation and to see how it can sort of act as a catalyst for, for change to make cities uh, and societies more robust. I should not say vulnerable. That's, that's what I learned from JPI, but indeed robust. I do like the term as well. Uh, and I think that's the big challenge. Uh, what we see now, for instance, uh, is the some of the advantages that we do not always need to travel that much. Right? We do not need to take a plane for every single meeting, for instance. And I think what, will, what, what might really change in this huge experiment of teleworking, I think it's by far the most interesting uh, global uh, experiment of teleworking that we have been witnessing over the past three months to really draw lessons from that and to see how to uh, how to cope with that, how to find a better balance between uh, working from home perhaps and working in offices, uh, how to find a balance between uh, physical meetings, I mean anywhere in the world, or indeed make use of the uh, new let's say forms of digitalization that we have. We should not be naive because I there was a lot of, let's say, wishful thinking also, especially at the beginning of, um, of, the, of the lockdown, where people say, oh, this is a huge opportunity and it will be a big game changer and uh, look at the need, look at the sky, it's all blue and uh, this is how we should move forward. This is, this is too naive, I would say. It's, it's far more complex than that and it really requires also a fundamental rethinking of the way we organize society. And here, I think, indeed, the, the manifesto gives also a few clues of the way uh, we might need to, to move forward. And I think we also need definitely the grassroots approach that you are, uh, uh, that you adopt uh, to link it indeed to policy making, even to this sort of high level top down policy making that we also need, by the way, uh, and to make sure that uh, we've, we've come to a sort of a new discussion about uh, a new form of reorganizing society and that will take a long time it's not easy at all uh, but i think uh, the uh, the situation that we are in now only exemplifies how much this is needed thank you very much martin and thank you thank you all this is a very very interesting uh, inputs also to see we've all been working in the same direction and uh, let's let's also see how also this this common direction will also continue also over the next months because i think we've seen that in the emergency we have all been much more open to solidarity to sharing and now some of the old habits are coming back so i think this will be definitely also something that we'll be having to uh, to to be a special attention also for the for the next step so our input of the of the of the manifesto combined with all the inputs and the surveys and the researches and the mapping that are being done by all of you and many of the organizations that are listening to us and for this i also invite our our audience to write comments to 
also share constructive criticism. You might totally not agree with anything that was said by our panelists, which you know uh, we hope you do to some extent at least. But you know it could be part of the part of the constructive dialogue. Um, and this also is the moment in which we would also like the the feedback also from the from uh, from our colleagues who are uh, representing EU institutions in the Commission or or uh, EU funding programs. And um, I would like to invite uh, Marianne from DG Employment to share with us um, her, her impression on what has been done by DG, by, uh, DG Employment up to now, obviously your mission managing the ESF funding and having a very strong mission in employment and social dimension in the upcoming crisis is a fundamental role. So what is the discussion that is currently taking place and what is, do you think, the space that social economy can have in uh, in uh, fostering, hopefully, a positive change. Thank you, Daniela. Thank you, colleagues. I had to turn off my camera, but I was listening carefully. And I also read the manifesto, of course. Um, I would like to start by saying that unlike uh, cities and smaller stakeholders, the EU is often um, known as reacting a bit slowly, let's say, in case of an emergency. But uh, Really, from the past month, I have to tell you that we have been working relentlessly to come up with instruments um, to tackle the crisis uh, health-wise and uh, also employment and um, social-wise. Excuse my grammar. Um, and this is why we came up uh, with the coronavirus uh, response initiative, the CRI, we call it. Uh, this is what I know most uh, because um, I work for the uh, European Social Fund. Uh, and the fund of European aid to the most deprived, FIAD. So this is what I would like to elaborate quickly on, just to say that we have managed to pass this CRI and CRI plus. This uh, basically in a nutshell, this consists in helping member states to reallocate funding towards other priorities or other actions quickly and with minimum burden so that we make actions. Uh, you know that EU funding is quite, um, tedious to manage, I mean, with a lot of rules, uh, you, you might be familiar with them, and uh, nevertheless, we managed to really make up uh, something really uh, responsive, and actually, later, uh, we came up also with, uh, with a new initiative called REACT EU for the current programming period until 2020, with uh, additional funding, additional actions that can be funded with the social fund and others. Perhaps my colleagues from the other DG will uh, focus on that as well. Um, but about the coronavirus response initiative, what we've done is that we've, uh, as I said, uh, we've eased some of the rules. And so far, what I can say about how member states have uh, taken this up is that we have seen examples of funding um, measures to protect employment, of course, such as a short time work scheme to protect employment and avoid redundancies. We have also seen extra funding for uh, medical staff, which means hiring, uh, skilling, uh, fast track training, um, hiring staff also for cleaning, for disinfecting, etc. Uh, we have seen many measures for skills uh, to skill uh, young people, skill new staff, get new skills during um, remote working or uh, for students that were uh, at home, for instance, they, they were able to access um, training in the meantime to avoid having uh, skills lost, for instance. A lot of uh, guidance, uh, employment counseling, and of course, social assistance to the most vulnerable. Uh, that's also what the FEAD is about. So we have managed to help further the organizations delivering um, material assistance, food supplies, uh, health, uh, protective equipment, etc. So this is starting to really to, to really increase. And we have seen that the coronavirus response initiative has, is likely to make a difference. So we're quite proud of that. Um, then um, I would like also to react to what the other speakers have said before about, for instance, um, uh, urban uh, type of actions here at DJ Employment and for the social fund. You may be aware that we do not have a, such a direct management um, facility to have direct funding like this. We have this under the Employment and Social Innovative pro Program, but the Social Fund does not do it. This being said, 
cities can access funding, and they do in many member states, where the managing authority, so the national administration in charge of implementing the funds and programming the funds, they can launch calls for cities. And we have seen this in Belgium, um, Finland, Sweden, and other countries. So this is definitely possible. And here, this leads me to tell you that uh, now is really a good time, a perfect time to get in touch with your funds managing authorities to try and have a place, have a say in the debates around future funding, because we have also this thing that we're very proud of called the partnership principle. And according to this principle, cities, local authorities, stakeholders, civil society, and all relevant partners should be invited to participate in uh, designing, implementing, evaluating the funds. Now we know that sometimes it's, it's a bit difficult and the principle is not necessarily implemented to the fullest, but first of all, be assured that we are here to support this and we are absolutely 100% committed to implementing it in the next programming period, as well as in the current one. And um, second, you also have you can also request this and be aware that this process exists and that is really important. Um, then I would like also to say that everything I've heard is, of course, extremely in line with what we do with the social fund, um, inclusion, protection of the most vulnerable, fight against poverty, um, health, social care. So, of course, we can only be agreeing with you and we are also looking forward to more suggestions and um, looking forward to the member states taking your ideas up and possibly with, with EU funding, um, hopefully. And I would like also, yes, Martin, you mentioned, I think the, 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 the green economy and also the, the greening of, of the, the, the general context. You may be aware that the social fund is uh, going to contribute as much as we can to a just and green transition by investing in green skills. So this means retraining people towards green economy, green um, enterprises, etc. And we also have, um, this is also more for my colleagues probably, but the Just Transition Fund, which aims to uh, help regions who heavily rely on um, energy intensive, uh, like coal, etc to move towards a greener uh, economy. So we will be contributing to the Green Deal. And I think in that sense, uh, the commission has reacted uh, uh, in, the, in the proper way. Then just to finish um, with this, um, I would like to, uh, to say, uh, yeah, social economy, that was actually the question. Um, social economy, you may be aware that we are preparing a social economy action plan. So uh, both the president of the commission and our commissioner, Nicolas Schmidt, are extremely committed to this. And uh, we have started, uh, obviously, doing this. It's planned for uh, the end of 2021, if I'm not mistaken. Now, um, the social fund can support and has supported social economy, obviously. Uh, but um, on behalf of the commission, I can say that uh, we are fully supportive of social economy and fully, we fully acknowledge its contribution to, um, to the recovery and to tackling the crisis. And we are extremely aware that it has been one sector that has been also had uh, very hit by the crisis and that needs support. So we will obviously take this into account when uh, refining our thinking around the, um, the social economy. Uh, action plan and with the new multi-annual financial framework. Now, uh, my unit is not necessarily specialist in social economy, um, but I would like to say as well, because I have to leave, as I said, and I'm very sorry, but you can direct your questions to um, Daniela uh, and her colleagues, and I will be happy to respond if I can, and if not, then uh, redirect you to colleagues. Uh, it will be uh, my pleasure. Thank you.
Thank you very, very much, Marianne. We know you have to now jump into the next call. We know that this, this time is, is, is crazy with webinars and Skypes and everything. We thank you very much for, uh, for being with us. And we're looking forward to knowing more about the action plan that you're, being, that you're developing, because I'm sure that there will be a lot of, of uh, uh, stakeholders involvement in the process as well. So we're very happy to, with all the, all the network that is around this, this work, to, uh, to share also the inputs and the dialogue. So thank you very much. And we wish you, uh, you. a very fun also next webinar. So thank you for joining us and, sp and see you soon. And as, uh, as Marianne said, so goodbye from all of us. As Marianne said, any questions uh, that you have to also all the panelists, write them in the, in, the, in the Facebook chat. We will be sharing with them in the best of traditions. We're running a bit late, um, but uh, nevertheless, if we're not able to discuss everything in this occasion, we will be anyway sharing it with them in a, in, in a moment and providing you with the, with, the, with the feedback and so on. So as we said, this is the final event of the quarantine, but hopefully the beginning of a, of a more um, uh, long-term construction process. So one of the things is definitely sort of consolidating more the relationship. So we're very, very happy about this. So this said, I would like to uh, invite to also feedback uh, on, uh, on, on also on, on what Marianne was saying, but also sharing what, what the DG Rijo is making. I would like to invite Peter and Andor to share with us what has DG Rijo, what has been the discussion within DG Rijo in relation to what is happening now and what has, have been, let's say, in the emergency condition, the, the measures that you have taken, and how is this impacting the long-term discussion? We know that there is the 2021-2027 uh, discussion for the funding. There is a lot of discussion about not only the allocation of total money and funds that will be, will be put, but also what will be the priorities, the PO5, we know that there will be a lot of uh, attention also in relation to what would be the instruments. And for example, there was the, the instrument of the community-led local development, hence the CLLD, which is being implemented by a limited amount of pioneer cities around Europe. To what extent could this be an opportunity, for example, if not this, other instruments to support more a collaboration between the public and uh, the social private and uh, organizations to really deliver uh, better services and better welfare on the ground. Um, so if the connection is uh, allowing you, we'd be very happy to get your feedback. So you choose whether it's uh, Andor or Peter who would like to first feedback on this. Peter, you want to start? Please go yes. ahead. Well, well, hello. Well, hello. So make it as a dialogue between you two. I mean, as <laughs> <laughs> yes, we can always complement each other. Um, yes, indeed. So what uh, Marianne said, uh, uh, we've been very busy in uh, DG Regio as well to to mobilize the available cohesion policy funding in this programming period to the immediate uh, response to the COVID crisis. Uh, this is a so-called coronavirus response initiative. But now uh, with the new revised uh, uh, multi-annual financial framework proposal, which came out in May, the focus is now shifting from the quick response to the crisis more to crisis repair and recovery. So to address the medium and longer term consequences of, uh, of this. Um, but here we also face some important limitations, um, namely that the longer term impacts are, are, are much more difficult to assess for, for such an unprecedented uh, shock. Um, and, uh, and the only thing that seems to be certain is that uh, the effects are asymmetrical. And this is uh, what made cohesion policy uh, one of the key instruments for, uh, uh, for the medium and longer term response. And that's why uh, in the next MFF, uh, the cohesion policy uh, was proposed to strengthen. Um, and uh, just to provide some in interesting uh, preliminary findings for this asymmetrical uh, nature of the crisis is that, uh, for example, big and densely populated urban areas are clearly more disadvantaged in terms of the spread of the disease and in the early stages, what we could also uh, experience in, on uh, our own 
um, life because uh, because uh, social distancing affecting cities much more than uh, than less densely area populated areas. But the longer longer term effects uh, rely also on their capacity to respond. So. So where cities uh, usually are in a more advantageous position and uh, other territories or people who are relying uh, mainly on uh, non-digitalized sectors or in a more marginalized position and are far from uh, services and need to commute on a daily basis, uh, they might have uh, much, uh, much, uh, uh, bigger challenges in the long term. Um, but uh, what is the positive uh, side of this whole situation is that the crisis can also bring a positive momentum for the much needed changes in our society and for our cities. And uh, what the Commission labeled as green and digital and just transition that also provides a good opportunity, I think, to, to rethink and reconsider the, uh, the urban planning and urban governance. And, and this, we are very uh, happy to see the, co the collection of good practices from, uh, from the various stakeholders, uh, because that provides good uh, uh, basis to, to discuss these uh, responses. For example, compact city, uh, policies are seemingly emerging. Also the resilience or what I've heard now, it's the robust city uh, concept is something that, uh, that uh, will be very important to consider. Uh, so, so basically this is uh, where we are now in terms of the conceptualization. So, so the digital, the just, and the green transition are the key uh, areas also for the recovery phase. And luckily the next uh, framework, so the 21, 27 period is, uh, is designed for this uh, transition. So, so it was not a big change in terms of the overall architecture for the future cohesion policy uh, as a response to the COVID, but it's more of a fine tuning and maybe reconsidering uh, the priorities and the how uh, that's what will come. And in this sense, uh, uh, I, I hope that uh, these novelties that was introduced, for example, this new policy objective that is called Europe Closer to Citizen, and uh, also the community and local development, what was mentioned also as an instrument. I hope it will give a new impetus for more participatory urban uh, development. And, uh, and now um, the CLLD instrument is also, uh, recognized for urban areas as, uh, as an important contribution to sustainable urban development. So I hope this will help the uptake of this uh, community-led uh, local okay. initiatives within cohesion policy. So I think it's, uh, it's, 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 it's a good opportunity. I hope it, it will bring us uh, a new and positive impact is that now in the crisis, cities and also uh, governments are reconsidering what is important and what needs to be changed. Okay, thank you, Peter. <laughs> Arthur, would you like to, to, uh, yeah. to also integrate what Peter was telling us? But I have a very simple job. Sorry, you're mute. I'm and mute. There you go. No, probably not. Right. So I have a very simple job now. So after Marianne and Peter, actually, I just have to say just a few words. And uh, that's what I will do. And saving your time as well. So I think the point is here that we already know that there are two main problems or let's say issues what we are facing now. One, how the services should be reconstructed or reformulated, healthcare and social services, and how to boost the, let's say, the economy. So what is the recovery plan actually to go back to the kind of normal economic operations? And these two legs should be understood actually when it comes to the EU funds operations as well. 
either at the local level or national level, it's basically um, everywhere. So uh, what, what the Codex they explained, this is um, very well described actually in the 1420 regulatory package, let's say the REACT EU and all of the other things. And also, if you see the 2127 regulatory package, there are some new elements exactly to react actually on these kind of questions, because otherwise we will not be able to to, uh, let's say, uh, discuss it with member states, actually how to react uh, on these questions. And I would like to highlight uh, one important question, what we we don't know actually how to, let's say, uh, handle at this moment. And I have to be very honest and open with you. And this is about the kind of multi-level governance questions, because uh, we know very well that some of the issues like, again, social care services and healthcare services, and of course the economic recovery as, um, as well, these are actually both in the hands of local authorities and the national authorities as well. But how to find, let's say, the best cooperation between these two levels, or even three, when the regional, uh, let's say, authorities, they are coming into the picture, that's a difficult question. And that what you have seen in the last two, three months about the social care homes, for example, uh, in different countries, let's say the, um, the incidence of COVID-19 infections or the death rates are really very, it was really very high in the social care homes. In some countries, it reached to 50%, actually, the overall death uh, rate uh, in social care homes. But if you see actually who is running the social, social care home, you have a very, very, very diverse picture. In some countries, much more, let's say, decentralized. So it's the responsibility of the local authorities. In other countries, it's really centralized. And the social uh, services are really in the hand of the government. So the question is for us how to find, again, the balance and how to avoid such situations in the future that uh, we don't know necessarily, actually, who is able to prevent such situations and how to, uh, who is able to protect people who are residing in these facilities. That's not an easy question. And uh, the colleagues who are sitting in this panel, they know very well because we were discussing it in the last couple of years, many times that the multi-level governance is one of the most difficult questions actually in front of us. And um, we need to find probably better solutions for the future because um, in some countries, even actually we have seen some, let's say conflicts between the national and the local level kind of pointing to each other who is responsible for what. This is not the right approach. That's, we can agree on that. But the question is then what to do next. Thank you very much. That was it from my side. Thank you, Andor. Thank you, Peter. So we will be having then after a, a, a closing round from all of the speakers who have stayed, who could stay until the end to also get, give, um, give some last final, final words and final remarks. It's, I mean, and we also appreciate from the colleagues that in the commission, because we know that these are very intense days on uh, on you. So to find the time to also share share with us is is uh, is very relevant. And we're getting comments also from the from the from the comments on Facebook also that uh, it's it's very interesting to also get to understand a little bit more of what what is actually the discussion in the EU Commission aside of what we what we hear on the news, which is not always extremely accessible. Um, before we, yeah, well, I see you. <laughs> well, that's part of it. Um, so thank you very much for this translation effort. Um, we also got a message from um, Mr. Shida, who is the vice president of the uh, uh, urban intergroup. Uh, so also to get a little bit of the impact from the political side of the of the EU. And uh, so we, we would like to share with you um, just a couple of minutes video of what was his, uh, his input. President of the Urban Intergroup, I think it is specifically important to underline the social function of cities. This is affordable housing, this is communal planning, especially in the field of traffic, of public transport. The possibility also that city-owned facilities like public transport, like uh, water services, like uh, other public services are not under pressure. And especially in these days of climate change and COVID-19, it is important to underline how important is social systems, how important is a good functioning health system, and how important is also to think about the future in a climate change. This means green cities sustainable cities, sustainable ways of transport, sustainable ways of energy production could be also happening in the cities. Let's think about the rooftops, 
where we can put also the solar panels, and also how we can make cities, especially in climate change, more livable. It means greener cities and cooler cities. More trees, more water, more better life for those which cannot afford to have a swimming pool in their shadow garden. So this is this is a, an input that, that we received, and I think it's a very interesting integration from the political side, also integrating what the what the colleagues um, were telling telling us about from the from from the actual uh, offices of the of the DG region, who are then the ones that are actually transforming together with also the colleagues from the other DGs, obviously transforming then some of the indications also into 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 reality. Um, and I think it's very interesting that because all the focus is going now on very strongly on the environmental issues, um, I think it's quite interesting is that, that the subtext actually is to understand how the focus on the environmental issues can be a, a, a way to foster economic growth, which I think is the main topic of conversation. And how can we make sure that this is also an, op an opportunity for social inclusion? So who will be the companies that are benefiting from the, the, uh, the, 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 the grants that are, or, the, or the subsidies that are going towards uh, greener cities? Is it large multinational companies? Is it smaller companies that are maybe having, you know, opportunity for uh, labor engagement of marginalized groups that we know that it, it, it's a completely different uh, effort and it's also a very completely different uh, effort in terms of public procurement, all these not so fancy words, uh, but this is actually fundamental to be able to then really translate things into practice. And in the panoramic of what is happening around Europe, I would like to invite Nula to share with us the insights from Urbact. You have been now, uh, as a program, you've been around for I think one of the longest is that now you're, end, you're finishing the third mandate of, of Urbact, bringing together cities to share knowledge, to build capacity, to foster innovation, to build their um, capacities in terms of participation and, and, and social innovation. And as I'm, I and my, my team are very involved also in some of the projects with you, we can definitely know that you really push this forward. Can you share with us what has been Urbac doing during this crisis and where do you think that we really need to put our attention and our efforts towards really fostering social inclusion and social solidarity economy in our cities? And also one of the comments that came from the audience, and you're very right, we foster, we focus on cities, but we also have countryside and we also have secondary cities. It's not all, only about the megalopolis. Absolutely, we take on this comment. You are absolutely right. We're talking about larger territories. So Nula, can you share with us your, your insights? Yeah, thanks, uh, Daniela. Good, good evening, everyone. And uh, uh, I hope uh, I won't uh, yeah, take up too much time uh, since um, it's already gone quite long. But uh, thanks for the introduction to, to Urbact. Um, yeah, we're an exchange and learning program, uh, as, as Daniela said, um, part of cohesion policy, so funded by the regional, European Regional Development Fund. And uh, so we fully subscribe to, to Peter's uh, assertion about the role of of Europe in, in helping overcome uh, those disparities that uh, have been so strongly highlighted in, in recent months. Um, yeah, I can summarize the, the, the support we've provided to cities uh, in, I guess, three main points. And uh, just to build on your last remark, uh, in Urbact, uh, we uh, welcome cities of, of all sizes. We use city as a generic terminology, but we have uh, um, involved in our networks uh, small cities uh, of 10,000 inhabitants in, in rural um, parts of, of Europe, two uh, capital cities, uh, each bringing their own uh, context, uh, but their own knowledge and each with uh, something to learn. Um, so maybe the first uh, thing that we've been doing is uh, of course sharing experience and, and knowledge, it's what we do. Um, we have mapped uh, the, the city responses um, to the COVID crisis. Uh, not so much in a, in a research perspective, but more um, to understand how cities who were participating in Urbact uh, and uh, already uh, practicing these um, participatory approaches and um, integrated development, uh, how they were using their activities in Urbact to, to react to the crisis. And we've put these together in, a, in an online map uh, that, you can, uh, that you can have a look at on, on our website. Um, and because of that, yeah, I think we were also able to contribute to some speakers to, to previous webinars to share a little bit also their, their experience. Um, one example, the, the city of Cork in, in Ireland is part of the, the Playful Paradigm Network, 
which is exploring how play can help cities reappropriate a public space. And uh, during the lockdown, of course, and public space was also locked down. So they prepared uh, play at home resource packs, especially for socially disadvantaged communities. Um, you know, those people living in, in uh, smaller residences where they don't necessarily have access to outdoor space uh, and so on. So we saw a, swi a switch or pivot of, um, uh, of cities who were using their, their air backed um, resources and networks to, to tackle directly the, the crisis. You also mentioned the, uh, the term public procurement. I'm glad you brought that up first. Uh, it is quite a behind the scenes uh, concept, but really uh, super important uh, in uh, tackling uh, how and, and where the, the funds are spent, public funds. And um, we have a network called Making Spend Matter uh, on measuring public procurement spend. And, uh, and that network is led by Preston in the UK and uh, collected how, how the partners are responding to, to COVID-19 in terms of procurement processes and practices. Um, and that will feed into uh, work that Urbact is doing um, on a, an online training course on social and environmental clauses in public procurement. So I think um, in terms of what cities are maybe looking at their challenges going forward is, is how they can build in um, these more socially uh, aware uh, practices uh, into all aspects of, the, of, their, of their city management. We also um, had a series of, of articles and editorial reflections on how COVID-19 uh, affects cities um, working on, on topics that are already very present, you know, such as the climate uh, crisis, as we've mentioned, poverty, gender equality, uh, food uh, production and, uh, and supply. Um, not so much to predict the world after COVID, but to outline uh, some of the policy, policy challenges that, uh, uh, that we saw and maybe set up some of the, um, of the conversations uh, for, for further um, capitalization work that, that we can do uh, going forward. Um, I maybe just wanted to mention here, um, in relation to the discussion around um, the governance and multi-level governance and, uh, and how that is impacting on, on cities. Um, uh, we, we did some work um, last year uh, that came out of the Urban Agenda Partnership on, on poverty, actually, and uh, around um, how cities, uh, regions and national level um, uh, governments can work together uh, in the frame of a, of a pact or an agreement to tackle poverty, for example, in, in urban areas. And, um, and that uh, resulted in a, in a set of guidelines uh, that, uh, that we have available that we've shared also with the European Commission as a way of um, helping cities and national level organize their, um, uh, their governance going forward to tackle specific challenges. So we think um, tools and, uh, and guidelines like, uh, like this will be, um, I think even more important uh, going forward as uh, cities, as national governments, as European level are looking for, um, for things that, uh, that have already worked. Um, the, the second uh, kind of main task we've been doing uh, is more practically to, to support to the networks. You know, we finance networks as a project, two and a half year project. Um, so of course we've had to uh, revise the, the project implementation. They've got some more time for, for delivery. Um, but uh, like uh, everyone else, we've also been supporting uh, them as we are learning ourselves to make this uh, not so much a shift, but a leap into the digital world. I think digital transition is a, a thing of the past. Now we've made the digital leap and uh, how we can support uh, cities um, who don't necessarily have yeah, the, the skills uh, and the, the practice uh, to, to, to manage that. Um, so we've been trying to model you know, some good behavior as well, testing tools with them. We had to shift all of our um, capacity building and training activities uh, online. Um, and uh, yeah, so there's been a big learning curve uh, for us, but also um, I think the third element is, uh, is now in kind of this stage now and going forward is re redefining or at least reflecting on the role of, of European cooperation itself. Um, you know, we have just, um, launched a, a round of, of networks that were they're about to begin their, their exchange and learning activities. And we had to you know, take into consideration that uh, a lot of the city staff who are doing this work uh, above and beyond their, their daily work were redirected to more urgent uh, frontline uh, activities. Um, and so cooperation then takes maybe a, a second uh, secondary priority uh, during this uh, crisis phase. Um, but we're also quite um, impressed with the level of solidarity and exchange that, that, we, that we saw between the cities and our networks who were really willing to keep that, uh, keep that exchange going um, during the crisis. 
And uh, of course, what is the role of European cooperation when cities cannot physically meet? Uh, um, I think we, of course, we need to tackle that extensive, you know, use of travel. And uh, um, as, as Martin said, you know, we, we really need to, to, to bring that into question, especially in light of the climate emergency. But in terms of cooperation across Europe, building trust is so important for this exchange. And that's extremely difficult to, to create online. Um, so I don't think we'll see them the complete you know, disappearance of, of physical meetings. Um, but certainly we are working with our cities to see how we can make those meetings you know, the most um, impactful. Um, so we, yeah, we're also in the view of, of the next uh, program for, for Airbus 4, hopefully, um, to, you know, to use this time also to experiment on, on new ways of cooperating and feed that into to the next uh, program. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, so we, we strongly believe also in, in what you've mentioned around no one left behind. You know, this is really important when we're talking about the digital divide as well in terms of social inclusion. And, uh, um, and we'll be uh, yeah, continuing some of our, um, of our ongoing knowledge hub work on, on that. Um, I just, I know it's <laughs> one more thing that I wanted to mention is that in, in the frame of that no one left behind, we're, we're, we, we're tackling that um, in a webinar um, next week. One of our ongoing knowledge hub actions is around the right to housing. And, uh, and we'll be looking at homelessness and, and migration in relation to, to housing uh, next week on the 26th of June. So I think it would be an interesting uh, maybe follow on conversation uh, from, from this. So that's our, our big picture thinking in, on Urbac. The, Really to link to, to the crisis. Thank you very much, Noala. Those topics are very, very important for the near future, but um, were anyway very pressing issues. Unfortunately, it's six thirty, and uh, a lot of participants had to leave. They all say thank you, and we thank them for participating. We would like to skip this time the question and answer because we are so late, but give a final moment to the panelists who uh, could afford to stay longer with us. Martin, would you like to share with us your thoughts, future hopes, wishes, um, or where you want to start working <laughs> next week? <laughs> Okay, I'll make three short remarks then. Um, one is that I very much second also what Daniela already said because I, I, I wanted to mention it also in my intervention that the, um, the, 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 the public um, authorities have a, a big say in, in defining the transformation of society now. Indeed, with all their huge subsidy programs, the millions and billions and trillions of euros that are invested in society. I mean, they can also, yeah, thanks to uh, uh, their subsidy programs, public procurement guide also uh, the economy in a different way and looking into a more equal, just, uh, let me use the words of the new Leipzig Charter, a just green and productive uh, cities and societies indeed. I think that's very important. And, Second thing is that um, citizens actually would need to play an important role in, uh, in keeping uh, this transformation agenda high uh, uh, in the interest also and in, within the focus of all the policy makers and the politicians. And the third remark, and I think already, this is an, an excellent start doing so, is that we as organizations are coming from different uh, areas with different uh, angles, we need to work together also. And I think it would be really great to, uh, to use this as a momentum for further collaboration. We are all organizing meetings or research activities. We reach out to policymakers and to civil society. I think it's important to, to continue uh, doing that. And uh, as far as I'm concerned, this would be an invitation also to all of you to cooperate with us in the, uh, the, the events that we will be organizing very soon. And we'll keep you informed about that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Martin. Um, thank you also for the invitation. Johannes, you have been silent for a while. Would you like to share with us your final thoughts and wishes uh, how we should proceed? Thank you very much. Um, again, thank you very much for, for the opportunity to, to speak here. It was a pleasure to um, bring forward our perspective, but also to hear what the colleagues are working on and their perspective uh, it has been very helpful for me. I would just like to uh, stress two points, maybe uh, what I mentioned before, and one is connected to something that came in the chat on, on Facebook is, I really want to stress uh, that we need to, as programs and people working on setting up these kind of programs, have to work with 
finding the, uh, the right frameworks to engage with, uh, let's say, the non-usual suspects which work on sustainable urbanization. And the second uh, refers to the Facebook comment. It was about um, uh, these experimental approaches. Again, went a little bit on how can we make these temporary um, um, experiments or what has been this a talk intervention which, ha which happened over COVID uh, uh, during COVID nineteen. How can we learn from that? And I think we 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 need to be we need to have this 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 idea, so we need to capture, synthesize these ideas, draw the learnings from them, and see also where there's deficit maybe in, in democratic processes, which were um, of this intervention, which were set up very quickly, maybe out of the necessity. But we need to learn from that, how we can make our, our cities maybe more robust in the long course. Yeah, that's it. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Johannes. Peter, would you like to say uh, a few words, final comments, recommendations? Yes, I just would like to thank you all for this very good uh, uh, panel discussion. I, I'm also very hopeful that uh, we are able to turn this crisis to, a, to a, a new impetus for this transformation agenda, what was said by Martin. Because, uh, because I believe now it is, uh, it is very evident to everybody that we need to change how our society is uh, operating. Uh, and, uh, and in this regards, I'm very hopeful that uh, we will be able to also rethink and rediscover uh, more participatory and uh, integrated ways of uh, urban planning and urban governance. Uh, and I'm also looking forward uh, to the renewal of the Leipzig Charter and the whole urban agenda pro process, which was uh, a very important experiment on multi-level and multi-stakeholder governance at EU level. Uh, and I think we have now, hopefully, or we will have now, hopefully, all the means and resources to make this change happen. And also the uh, need is now more evident. At least this is what we see from the Commission side and from all stakeholders that that now everybody is uh, is eager to change, even those that were that's more reluctant to accommodate this. So this is my very hopeful <laughs> closing remark. But I hope I'm, I'm not not too optimistic and naive. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Peter. We can only join you in your uh, wishes. Uh, Andor, would you like to add anything to Peter? Um, thank you very much. Um, really, uh, my job is today just simply just to say really a few words. So, I mean, um, that's, that's a very good job. I like it very much, to be honest. Um, so, um, as I'm more working on funding and not necessarily on urban development, uh, that's why um, for me, the really the most important question is now that with the limited resources what we have that member states have and cities they have how to to prioritize actually these issues what we discussed today um that's that's a difficult question to be honest because um there are really a variety of of challenges in front of us but how to find the, let's say the most important ones and um and use the funding the european funding actually um to tackle discussions it's not an easy discussion because what we've seen actually with peter just recently in the last couple of weeks there are really different needs uh, starting from transport to the healthcare services and it's all of these things should be let's say um tackled by the eu funds but that's not an easy question so everything what we are doing here um that could be a good help actually to, to work on this a bit better and to focus really on the most important things. And thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you very much, Andrew. Noala, would you like to add a few words or last comments or um, wishes? Um, yeah, it was um, really uh, helpful to hear what uh, what other uh, organizations are, are doing. And we, uh, we we hear the call to, to co contribute and, and collaborate. And that's definitely in the Urbac DNA. So, Hopefully with them, um, I think we have an opportunity, um, but uh, as Andrew just said, also maybe a risk um, in, uh, in, in keeping you know, some of these issues uh, at, the, at the top of the, of the agenda. Um, we, we also would, um, you know, the, the climate crisis hasn't gone away either, you know, so that uh, um, this discussion on, um, uh, on the health crisis doesn't, uh, you know, overtake uh, or distract from uh, the, the ongoing work that needs to be continued to, to tackle uh, those crises. 
Um, and we have, uh, I think, the opportunity with the um, with the networks that have just started in Urbac, to, who are, you know, having to adapt maybe the focus of their of their network um, linked to to the crisis as a kind of a, a test bed for for these different um, practices, uh, so that we, we can really share um, with uh, with you and what uh, Nicholas mentioned at the beginning, you know, what what is working and and what uh, maybe can be built on into into more sustainable policy. So uh, cautious optimism from us. <laughs> Thank you very much, Noala. The last 13 weeks were very, very intense. We got a lot of reactions and experience from our network and we will continue in uh, soon with uh, more opportunities to bring grassroots organizations together with decision makers and policy makers. Um, thank you very much for participating in this panel and sorry for those who couldn't stay so long and sorry that we prolonged so much. I would like to give the word back to uh, Daniela. Thank you for joining us and stay tuned with us. So uh, I think there was a Spice Girls song the, so, that was something about this is, uh, this is uh, the beginning, not the end or something like that. So just to end on a sort of uh, happy hour, Friday, Friday evening pop, uh, pop, but you're not gonna get it as a background, I'm afraid, sorry about that. But um, this is really the idea. So the quarantine hopefully is over. We will not be meeting Friday evening anymore, if not hopefully soon in person to go out for a nice drink and exchange informally as we have been doing anyway up to now. So at this point, it's the thank you round. We promise we will keep it short. So even though we should probably open up, you know, like one of those, like when, when you had in medieval times, the Kings, you know, reading out the very long list of, uh, of issues because there's a lot of people to thank. First of all, a big thank you to the speakers, those of you who were, you know, the, the ones up until the end of the session today, but also those who have contributed with the videos or in the first part of the, of the session today, because this was a very relevant uh, for all of us and the audience. This brings us to a big thank you to all the people that have joined. I can't remember anymore from the, the event this presentation, how many people have actually joined. Levente can join in, he will, no? Okay. But anyway, there's so many people that have joined up to now to share their insights from different cities and different rural areas. Also, I would like, we got a comment about, you're always concentrating on the city. It's not true. 69 Leventy writes. Okay, thank you. So a lot of people that throughout the last months have been sharing. So a thank, big thank you to all the speakers. A big thank you to the audience who has been, you know, listening into the Facebook live and commenting live and getting questions and we apologize if sometimes we run a bit late like today and we won't have a chance to get the, all the questions delivered to our speakers we apologize but we will send them to them anyway separately. And last but absolutely not least as a last episode I would like on behalf of Utropian to give a very big thank you to all the team because you see have seen throughout these months a big uh, the faces of myself of Levente and Bahanur but there is a team of 10 people that are different in different ways taking care of the newsletters that arrive to you to the social media to setting up the videos to making the video interviews and doing all these things that have been really uh, a big effort from our side for a small organization that really believes in this that we're doing so we really look forward to to sharing with you all, all of this work. A big thank you to all the team. Thank you very much to Sophie, to, so to Jorge, to Yilmaz, to Manuela, to Clara, to everybody. I'm probably messing out some names and they will forgive me right now in, the, in Stefano. I'm getting my colleague waving saying, come on, what about me? I'm here. So big, big thank you. And at this point, I would say that it's really time for having a fantastic weekend and a fantastic evening and uh, we will be sharing uh, uh, an article on the inputs that came out from today next week and we will be continuing the dialogue with this speakers as Johannes was suggesting and other and other players also because it's really important to continue dialoguing and working together have a fantastic Friday night and goodbye thank you see you soon thank you so much congratulations bye bye Bye-bye.